Welcome everyone to Spring uh, Take Charge, April 2023. Um, so lovely to have you all with us uh, for our education session for tonight. Uh, my name is Marissa. I'm uh, working as part of the Take Charge team. Uh, I've been involved for a little while now, but uh, we've had a bunch of breaks during COVID. So we're, we're just getting things back up and running in this new uh, virtual format. Um, the session tonight will be recorded and put on our um, Take Charge alumni channel. Um, I have to find out it may also be put on Cardiac College, but um, once we get the recording set up, um, I'll send a notice to everyone to let them know where you can find the recording as well. Uh, if you want to review any, any of the information that's discussed tonight. Okay. Um, there is a section for Q&A, so if you do have questions as we go throughout, uh, you can go ahead and type in your questions there. Uh, please do not use the chat function, um, and we'll kind of go through the ins and out as we start with the presentation. Okay, um, so we're hoping this will run close to eight o'clock, we'll, we'll finish. Um, and then we are planning another take charge session in May. Most likely we're looking at uh, May 25th, uh, but once I get that confirmed, then I'll uh, send out another notice. We'll have um, Veronica Rouse, one of our dietitians here at Cardiac Rehab, um, talk about sodium and heart health, okay? And then with blood pressure in that uh, realm as well. So following a theme. Uh, okay, so getting started. Uh, so welcome everyone. I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. So Dr. Carolina Carvalho is one of our cardiologists here at Toronto C Cardiac Rehab. Um, you may recognize her if you were you've come in for a stress test recently or had any of your assessments. Uh, we are so so very lucky to have her uh, with us tonight and as part of our staff. Um, and so she'll be sharing her knowledge um, of of uh, blood pressure and your heart, and uh, and we'll get going from there. Uh, so, Carolina, take it away. Thank you, Marisa. Can you hear me well? We can hear you. Okay, good. So, thank you, everyone, for logging in tonight. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and I appreciate the invitation from Marisa and from all the organization team. And today, I will talk about my favorite topic, managing blood pressure for your heart. So for those who do who have not met me, uh, I'm a cardiologist. I've been working at Ramsey for four years, and I'm really passionate about cardiovascular prevention and rehabilitation. So we will start acknowledging the land, the traditional land, and I would invite you to ask me to take a minute to reflect on what it means and what we can do to help and to contribute to true reconciliation um, in this country, in, in this land. So moving forward, uh, our agenda tonight is first, we will talk a little bit about uh, ground rules. Then we will talk about managing blood pressure. That's why we are here tonight. And then as Marissa said, we will have time for questions and answers, okay? So what are the main objectives tonight? Is to recognize the importance of having a good blood pressure control, be mindful of lifestyle changes and medicines that can help to keep blood pressure under control. Also to identify the key steps when measuring blood pressure at home. And finally, I would invite you to reflect on your blood pressure control at the very end. So ground rules, this session is for education only. If you have a specific questions, please connect with your healthcare provider. We will answer questions generally, not personally. And I will be very happy to answer questions even after uh, if we don't have time to answer everything, and we will post just questions online, or even I will email you uh, with uh, addressing whatever questions you have. So to do that, you can use this question and answer button, usually in the bottom of your screen, and you can see here Q&A, okay? Please do not share any um, 
personal identification, okay? Uh, because others will be able to see it. So something that I want to start with is sharing this amazing website called hypertension.ca. So a lot of things that I'm going to talk tonight are coming from that website. It's a Canadian website dedicated to hypertension, not only to professionals, but also to patients and people living with hypertension or friends or caregivers that are interested in high blood pressure. And uh, so let's start. So first question is why we are here tonight? Why it's important to have good blood pressure control? At this point, I believe you already know the answer, but it's worth reminding everyone and looking a little bit at the numbers. So heart, heart disease, and when I talk about heart disease, I'm talking about coronary artery disease or heart blockages or heart attack or angina is still the leading cause of death worldwide. We know that in Canada, it's the second leading cause of death. Uh, and the numbers are really high. As you know, it's higher than um, depending on the age of the population, the background, the ethnic background, and the related comorbidities. So in Canada, how many people live with the, uh, high blood pressure? So approximately 23% okay, of adults. So one in four, in other, in other words. So it's a, it's a lot. And the worst is that a lot of people even don't know that they have high blood pressure because they never check it. And from those who know it a lot, start taking the medication, but then for different reasons, they stop taking the medications and then the blood pressure sometimes are high again. So we'll talk about that. And uh, we will talk also about uh, the, the fact that it's a silent killer. Why? Because usually people do not feel that the blood pressure is high. When they feel it, it's because usually it's extremely high or because that is another issue or even a cardiovascular event. So unfortunately, it's well known by the silent killer, okay? And the other thing that I wanted to mention is that we as cardiologists, we consider this high blood pressure as the most prevalent risk factor for heart disease, for cardiovascular disease. So I'm not now talking only about heart disease, like heart attacks, things like this, but also about stroke, dementia, and other things. And talking about these other things, so what are the deleterious effects of high blood pressure in our body? So it's not only about the heart, but let's start from the heart. So as you know, probably, coronary artery disease or heart blockages are directly correlated with people, with, with people that have high blood pressure. Those who live with high blood pressure, they also put the body or the heart uh, at a certain stress. So imagine that the heart should pump, should pump blood, but if the blood pressure is too high, then the effort that the heart should, could, should do is much higher than compared to a person that does not have that high blood pressure in the periphery. And then with that, the heart sometimes gets hypertrophic. And at the end, it's just hard to sometimes dilate. And then you have something called heart failure or heart dysfunction. Okay. So this is highly correlated with high blood pressure, unfortunately. And when we look at the eyes of um, someone with high blood pressure, if it has not been well controlled for many years, people can also develop what we call hypertensive retinopathy. So the vessels in the eyes also suffer from that high pressure. And we can see that like the optometrist, the eye specialist can see that. In the periphery, we can also have people that have pain when they are walking, what we call peripheral artery disease. And sometimes it can even lead to amputation especially if there is something else together, like high blood sugar or diabetes. In the brain, 
similar things happen. So we have the arteries everywhere, right? So in the brain, it's not different. And it can also lead to stroke to what we call TIA, intracerebral bleeding, and dementia. So we have people that have vascular dementia, and it can also be triggered by long time with high blood pressure that not being treated. And finally, very important is the effect that high blood pressure has in the kidneys. So one early sign of issues in the kidneys is, is when someone is losing albumina or albumin in their urine. So it's a type of protein and that's usually physicians when they are assessing the patient with a high blood pressure for the first time, they will request that you urine sample and they will check for that, okay? And they will follow. If it's increasing, maybe they needed to do more in terms of controlling the blood pressure. And finally, it's also possible that a person will develop renal disease or even renal failure requiring dialysis if the blood pressure is not well controlled. All of these we call target organ damage. And remember that name because I will talk again about this terminology, target organs damage, okay? Okay, so moving forward, only bad news, but now let's talk about something good. So you know that 80% of individual risk factors for cardiovascular disease can be modified. So it's definitely good news. And how we do that? So well known, stopping uh, to say smoking with cessation of smoking, taking our medications when it's needed, stress management, physical activities, and also eating uh, healthy. So we will talk about all of these in a minute. So let's start with lifestyle changes or healthy behavior. Which type of healthy behaviors can keep someone without having a high blood pressure or even if the high blood pressure is as well is already established can help to control that. So let's start with just table with some the most important healthy behaviors here on the left. So starting with physical activity, I'm sure you are um, all or some of you graduated from the, our program. You know that 30 minutes of moderate to intense exercise five days per week can be extremely helpful, not only to control the blood pressure, but also to help you to control blood sugar, and even to decrease the risk of a heart attack or a stroke at the end of the day. But what is the impact of this physical activity? So some studies showed that the impact is around four to nine millimeters of mercury, okay? So for some, you may think, okay, it's not that much, but I would like to share with you that there are many studies showing that even one millimeter of mercury when we decrease that in someone's blood pressure can help to decrease mortality and the risk of having a heart attack or a stroke because of the blood pressure, okay? So even one millimeter is important. Don't think that's not. Talking about now about DASH diet. So we talk a lot about Mediterranean diet and that DASH diet's a little bit similar. So we encourage people to eat fruits, vegetables, low fat, dairy products, whole grain foods, and protein from plant sources. It can also help a lot in terms of decreasing the blood pressure, okay? Sodium intake, this is a big one, and it's so important that we will have Veronica talking in our next encounter. But in a nutshell, what is important to know is that the target, like we need to eat less than 2.3 gram, grams of sodium per day. What is that? So it's usually more or less one teaspoon of salt or five grams of salt. Okay, so be careful with sodium and salt. And we are talking here about 2.3 grams of sodium or five grams of salt. And it can also have a 
good impact on controlling the blood pressure. Moving forward to body weight, it's usually not our main focus here when you do rehabilitation, because we believe that healthy behaviors, exercise, healthy eating will help at the end of the day to have to, for people to have a better control of the body weight. But it's important to mention that yes, losing weight for those who are not on target, uh, and the target will be something around 18 and to 24.9. So this is the considered BMI, normal BMI. And we can talk more about that, what is normal and what is normal in the questions, during the questions. But we know that if someone loses five, uh, sorry, if someone loses one kilo or more or less two pounds, it will represent a decrease in blood pressure in five to 20 millimeters of mercury, okay? It's a lot, in other words. Okay, um, and it's a most, if you, so in other words, if someone loses 10 kilos or more or less 20 pounds, it should be translating in a decrease in the blood pressure that is really similar to a medication, okay? So it's very well known that pe some people lose weight and then, oh, they need less medication. So it's something interesting to also um, put some effort. Smoking, as we know, we need to um, do everything to reduce or even to stop smoking. And I'm here, I'm talking about tobacco smoking. We know that cannabis probably do not have, does not have uh, benefits and should also be avoided. Alcohol, uh, the current guidelines says, the Canadian guidelines now suggest that uh, only two drinks per week is the recommended. Before, we know that it was less than two drinks per day. So we can also talk about that during the questions, but reducing alcohol can definitely impact the blood pressure around two to eight millimeters of mercury, okay? And finally, something that sometimes we take for granted is stress management, okay? So it's extremely important to have our mental health as much controlled as possible. And there are some relaxation techniques and also behavior interventions that can definitely help. So there are studies showing that, for example, yoga, meditation, mindfulness can also decrease the blood pressure. Okay, there is science behind that. And I'm also happy to talk more later if you want. So we were, we were talking about DASH diet. But I wanted to remind you that the Mediterranean diet or Mediterranean way of eating is so far the most um, studied diet and the diet that has been proved to have the greater benefit in terms of cardiovascular prevention. Okay, So we see here that following a Mediterranean diet or eating pattern can lower the risk of death from heart causes by 50 to 70%. It's a lot. And the good news is that if, for example, someone avoids uh, meat or other types of, for example, uh, a processed food, everything that is um, usually ready to be eaten. So inter although this is, easy to usually grab and eat. Um, those things that are ready or ultra processed, uh, they usually have other components and they may also increase the risk of, for example, uh, cancer. So when we are following a diet such as the Mediterranean diet, we are not only preventing cardiovascular disease, but we are also having other benefits. And one of them, is also preventing cancer, diabetes, and other things, okay? Okay, so moving now to medications, okay? So which type of medications we have, we have available and that is something new? So to talk about that, I like to talk about the heart first and to understand that the heart can be seen as a house, okay? So the first part, on the left is the pump. 
So we can imagine a house with a pump that's pumping water uh, to the other um, places in the house. And in terms of our heart, we are talking about the heart muscle, the heart chambers, we have four, and the heart valves, we also have four, okay? So our medications that are focusing more in the pump side of the heart and others that, for example, will focus more in the electrical aspect of the heart. And we'll talk more about that. So the electrical part is like the light, the wires that will help the energy to come and to have light in our homes, okay? Maybe you have heard about the blockage. So right to bundle blockage or AV blockage. So it's when there is some blockages here in the electrical area of the heart. And then there is an interruption of the system, the conduction. And then different things can happen. Some people will need a pacemaker, for example, in more extreme cases. And finally, on the right side, you can see the pipes. So now we are talking about coronary arteries. So these are the arteries who bring blood to the heart. And if you think about a house, we can think about the pipes that will bring water to all the places in that house, okay? Uh, when someone has a heart attack, there will be a blockage here, or there's a blockage here in one of these coronary arteries. And then we need it to make everything to try to open that vessel, that artery, and to prevent, prevent new blockages to happen in the other arteries or in the same area, okay? So when I, I will start talking about the medications and I want you to understand that many medications, sometimes we are targeting one thing, one aspect of the heart, but it will end up um, affecting the other things. And you understand that in one minute. So what are the common classes of med medications to treat high blood pressure? So we have the ACE inhibitors, those is finishing with Prill. We have the ARBs, and we will see more in details, those fine, uh, finalizing with TAM, so Lozartan, Candizartan, things like this. We have the case calcium channel blockers. We also have the diuretics, the beta blockers, and others. So we'll focus on the most common medications to reach a high blood pressure. But of course, there are many other options that are not so commonly used up front when we are treating blood pressure, okay? High blood pressure. So let's start with the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. Should Long just name, so we physicians, we usually say ACE inhibitors, okay? And uh, usually we are talking about ramipril, perindopril, trandolapril, among the others. What this medication does? So this medication will act mainly in the pump, in the muscle, but also in the pipes. So this medication, uh, this class of medication, is able to open up the blood vessels, lowering the blood pressure. So imagine that we have vessels everywhere in our body. And uh, with, um, while we get older, unfortunately, the vessels, the arteries get thicker and stiffer. So they are not as complacent as they were before. So the heart will pump blood but that artery that you were able to accommodate, those arteries that were able to accommodate that pressure that the heart is pushing uh, uh, under or uh, inside the arteries, they are no longer able to accommodate because they are thicker and stiffer. What this medication does? It will do what we call vasodilation and we, it will open up the blood vessels and of course it will help to lower the blood pressure. That is something that I love about this medication that is the vasoprotection or vasoprotection. What is that? So as I said, every uh, we get older and 
the arteries get thicker. So there are many layers in that wall of the arteries. And that those layers start to increase, to get thicker. But when someone, especially for example, when someone is eating too much salt, but if a person is taking ACE inhibitors and also another medication that I will show after that, that la those layers do not um, get thicker at the same speed compared to someone that is not taking this type of medications. So at the end of the day, you will have arteries that are more protected and the risk of having another or a heart attack is lower. But the good news is that it's also pro this medication also protects people from having a stroke because we have vessels everywhere, right? So it's the same thing. So this is one thing that I like very much uh, relating, uh, regarding this medication. Something else is that this medication is very helpful for those people who had a heart attack, for example, or have ha heart failure. And this medication helps the muscle, the heart muscle to heal. So it's something else. And finally, we know that this type of medications also help people living with diabetes to have their kidneys protected from this high blood pressure that if it's always there, we will also uh, cause a lot of problems, okay? Good. So there is another medication that's very similar to ACE inhibitors, but it's called ARBs or angiotensin 2 receptor blockers. So in other words, we are talking about valsartan, telmizartan, candesartan, and so on. Okay. So they are very similar. The only difference is that usually they are prescribed when this, when the ACEs inhibitors, they are not well tolerated by the patient, okay? So they are, I would say, as, if, as efficient as the others, but we leave that usually to a second, um, as a second choice compared to the uh, other medications that I just mentioned. Okay. So next we have the calcium channel blockers. So those who finish with epine or epine. So unload pin, nifedipine, and this one, jutiazin or jutiazin. Okay, there are others, but these are the most important. So they decrease the blood pressure, relaxing the blood vessels, and it can also help the blood vessels that we have in the heart. So some people who have high, uh, who have, chest pain or angina, sometimes they have this medication prescribed to help you with the pain, okay? Sometimes it's also prescribed after a heart surgery, for example, to help these vessels to be more relaxed just in that stage just after the surgery, okay? Um, the other thing is, especially the duty of them, it can help also to control irregular heart beats, okay? So it's a plus of this medication. Moving forward to the diuretics. So some of you know this as the water pill, and the main names are the hydrochlorothiazide, long name, and the chlorthalidone, and these two, are very frequently used to treat high blood pressure, okay? We have also in the same class, but we feel some difference, the furosemide and spironolactone, indapamide and amylorate. So furosemide and spironolactone, so they are more frequently used in people who live with heart failure, okay? And we are for furosemide people who live uh, with uh, also kidney disease. So that every medication has some uh, some details that will help us to treat certain conditions in people who have high blood pressure and also just other conditions. Or sometimes they don't even have high blood pressure, but these medications will help to treat these other conditions. So how this water pill um, works? 
So we know that uh, when we eat, especially salt, we will also retain more water, okay? So the more salt you, you eat, the more salt, the more difficult it will be for your kidney to deal with that water. And that water pill will help you to get rid of the water and the salt. So um, we know that to think. If, you, if your body is getting rid of the extra fluid, what will happen? That will be less work for the heart to do. Literally less volume, less fluids to be pumped. It will also reduce the extra fluid build up in the lungs in the lower legs and in the ankles, especially in those folks who live with high, uh, heart failure. And finally, to help to have a better control of the blood pressure. Okay, the other one is the beta blockers or those who the NG, we have the low. So bisoprolol, metoprolol, carvedilol, atenolol, propanolol, and there are many others. So how does it work? It reduces the blood pressure and the heart beats, helping the heart to work with less effort, okay? So imagine that the heart is there pumping blood. Sometimes it's difficult because the, 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 blood, the pressure is high in those vessels in the periphery. So some beta blockers, they also help the peripheral vessels to dilate, and then it should be helpful for the heart because it should be less effort to pump the blood. Uh, it should also decreases in a good way the heart rate. So it's like the heart is pumping blood, but in a more, in a way that's not so stressful, okay? Uh, it helps in this regard. And it's something that uh, we like a lot when we are seeing patients or people living with heart failure is the ability of beta blockers to help the heart to heal. So after a heart attack, for example. So sometimes you may be prescribed a medication like bisoprolol and you may think, okay, but I don't have high blood pressure. Yes, we know that. But you are probably prescribing that medication because it is going to help your heart to heal. Okay, and it's extremely important. Okay, so, oops. Uh, HE can also help, just to finalize here with this medication, can also help those who have angina, so chest pain, uh, because it will decrease the consumption of oxygen that the heart needs. And in a way, long story short, people have less uh, heart um, sh chest pain because of that. And the final thing is, it can, it's very famous because this medication is very famous because they can help uh, the heart beats when they are irregular. So some people live with atrial fibrillation, for example, or extra beats. And this medication will also help you with that, decreasing the extra beats and making the heart more regular. So these are a lot of things that the beta blockers can do. Okay, moving forward, I wanted to remind everyone, I myself sometimes forget, that um, everyone has a free visit available that we don't need to pay to talk to the pharmacist once a year, okay? So if you have questions, uh, it's been difficult to talk to your family physician, to your cardiologist, consider going and talking to your pharmacist to bring your medications, your supplements, everything that you're maybe taking, vitamins, everything, check if there are interactions between everything that you are taking, review whatever you are taking, check if you really need all, all of that, check if there is a better way to take everything so you don't forget. So there are many things that we can really get help from the pharmacist. Okay. Moving forward, uh, measuring blood pressure at home. So this is one of the, our learning goals today. And uh, I really like to talk about that because I think that it's extremely important. Why it's important? We have something called uh, white coat effect. 
what this white coat effect mean? It means that some people will have high blood pressure when they are in the doctor's office or even seeing a nurse. The blood pressure is higher there in that environment. But when they go home, the blood pressure is normal. Okay. How you know? Only if someone is measuring the blood pressure at home, right? The opposite is also possible, but less frequent. Someone who has a normal blood pressure when at the doctor's office, but has an increase in blood pressure at home. Again, once in a while, depending on your case, it's important to check the blood pressure out of the office. Um, out of the office. Okay. So let's talk about how we should measure. What is the technique? So if you have more questions and, and you want to go more in details about that, I again invite you to go and visit the hypertension.ca um, website. And this figure is from there. And uh, let's start here on the left side talking about very simple things that sometimes we forget. So when measuring the blood pressure, it's important to be sitting in a comfortable position with the back supported by something, by a chair or whatever. It's important to have the arm bare and supported, okay? So having those multiple layers and then put the cuff is not a good idea. Better to have the arm bare. It's very important to use a cuff size that is appropriate for your arm. So when you are buying a device, a blood pressure machine, there are some devices that you can even choose. You can add, you can buy an extra cuff that is smaller or even larger than the one that's coming with the machine. This is also very important. So the middle of the cuff should be at the heart level. You should apply the cuff according to the manufacturer's instructions. So sometimes they even say that there is a line that you needed to put uh, in a certain position in your arm. Very important, do not talk or move before or during the measure. Okay, don't talk. I know sometimes it's difficult. Um, don't cross your legs. Also something so simple, but we forget. And have your feet flat on the floor, okay? So this is the most recommended uh, position to measure the blood pressure. It's important to be in a quiet place. So I usually say go to a place where there is nobody else. And so you don't, you don't need to talk if there's nobody else. Um, it's extremely important to wait at least five minutes before measuring the blood pressure, okay? Why? Because if we are not truly resting, the blood pressure may be a little bit higher just because we are not uh, rested or we are still a little bit anxious with whatever is going on at home, okay? Do not exercise 30 minutes before taking the medication, the, sorry, before measuring the blood pressure, okay? So if you're going to measure the blood pressure, you can, for example, choose early in the morning when nothing really significant has happened. You wake up, you wait a little bit, and then you measure the blood pressure, and then you start your day, okay? No tobacco or caffeine for one hour before measuring the blood pressure. If needed, go to the washroom first, uh, empty your bladder and your bowel if needed. As again, do not talk. Uh, choose a validated device known to be accurate. So if you, maybe you have a device that has been there for 20 years, it's better to check with your family physician if it's uh, if they can compare with the device that they have at home, sorry, in the office. So you can compare and see if it is too uh, accurate. And finally, you should, you should choose a cuff with appropriate size for the arm, as I just said. Okay, after all these recommendations, I got a number there. How do I know if it's normal or not? So it will be abnormal if it's higher or equal, equal 135 or higher or equal 85 in terms of systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So we are talking about 135 over 85. Anything above that is abnormal. What should we do? 
you should talk to your family physician or your cardiologist and see uh, and seek further recommendations. Okay, good. Talking about the device, it's extremely important to have a good device. Doesn't need to be the most expensive, but it should be accurate. Where to find a list of the devices that have been checked and certified here in Canada? You can go to hypertension.ca and that is uh, on the left side of your screen, you see something called recommended devices listing. Click there and you see a huge list of devices and you can choose one from there, okay? Usually we know that those who have the uh, whole, those, sorry, those um, devices that the cuff is placed in the arm, not in the wrist, they are usually more accurate than those who are on the use it on the wrist. Okay, so if you can choose, try to prefer those automatics and with the cuff that you put in your arm. Okay, and uh, I love this video. I really think that it's a good resource. If you think that it was too much, too difficult to understand. I really uh, recommend you to take a look at this video. Uh, you go to YouTube or Google and you just write how to measure your own blood pressure, Heart and Stroke Canada, and you will find this video. In the bottom of your screen, you can also see this, um, this, uh, website, oops, this website address and you can use that to reach out to the website as well, okay? I think a video... Uh, is much more um, helpful than myself here talking. So I really encourage you to take a look at that. Okay, let's talk about the targets. So in terms of targets, the Hypertension Canada guideline was published in 2020. And here we have the numbers for our Canadian population. So healthy individuals, and I said healthy because Sometimes we think that you are healthy until we measure the blood pressure. So uh, the goal would be something below 140 over 90, okay? But if someone has, uh, sorry, if someone has some risk factors, but not that much, and the physician calculates the risk and they think that the risk of having a heart attack or a stroke is still low, and there is no target organ damage. Remember, those deleterious effects of the blood pressure in the kidneys, in the eyes, in the heart, brain, etc. So that person still has a blood pressure target of lower than 140 over 90, okay? But if someone has diabetes, then the target is a little bit different. It's 130 over 80, okay? We want the blood pressure below that. And finally, if someone is at a high risk of cardiovascular disease, what does it mean? A person who already had a heart attack, a stroke, or has uh, damage in one of those sites that I told you, eyes, brain, kidneys. So in other words, are living with renal disease or have had um, a stroke uh, or the physician calculates the risk and it's high, then the, the goal is more restrict. It's, we, we need to target a systolic blood pressure lower than 120. Okay, and I'm happy to talk more about that in the, during the questions. Very important, individualized approach. So your physician, for sure, knows you better than anybody else or should know. And it's possible that there are things that I have not talked about here in this presentation and that she is leading to a target that is different from what I just said. Okay, so if you are in doubt, talk to your physician and try to ask why or based on which um, rationale the, the target, your target is this or that, okay? Individualized approach is something that's extremely important and may explain a lot of difference if you feel that whatever you have is different. So we are 
going uh, to the almost to the end of this, of this presentation. And I want you to start to, at least to reflect on your blood pressure control and think what you can do, what you have been doing in terms of behavior change or diet or mental health or stress that could help you to prevent high blood pressure or to have a better management of your blood pressure. And if you want some more information, you can definitely take a look at our website, thecardiaccollege.ca. And there, there is a place called uh, Take Control that I'm sure you are familiar with. And that if you go to the left side and you go to Tools for Managing Your Condition, you see this uh, booklet or this guide taking your heart medications. So uh, there are more explanations about the heart medications. There are a lot of resources here that you can definitely use. So a diary where you can record your blood pressure and other things like this. So in summary, um, what we talked tonight, we saw that good blood pressure control can protect your heart, your brain, kidneys, vessels, decreasing your risk of cardiovascular disease. I will go further, decreasing your risk of dying because of cardiovascular disease. So well done if you have your blood pressure well controlled. So these are all the benefits that you're going to have, but probably have, we, we know that there are many others uh, when someone has a good control of the blood pressure. We know that health behaviors and certain health medications contribute to blood pressure control while having other health benefits. So those are examples that I said that uh, a medication should take uh, for high, high blood pressure, can also protect your vessels, can protect your kidneys, and so on. Extremely important to know your numbers. Consider measuring the blood pressure at home, okay? And finally, reflect on your blood pressure control, okay? Is it borderline? It's wonderful. Think about that. What you can do, what have you been doing, and celebrate the good things that you have been doing. I try to see the good side of this presentation. Okay, so now we are going to move to questions and answers. And I see that we have some in the Q&A. And uh, I will just finalize saying, saying that I thank you very much for uh, plugging in this, this night and uh, tonight. And uh, if you are a graduated, uh, a patient who graduated in, in, from our program, you know that you are more than welcome to come back once a year. Uh, just get a referral from your family physician or another physician or even healthcare provider, okay? And then we'll be happy to support you, not only with exercise, but also reviewing your risk factors, including high blood pressure, okay? Now, that's everything that I had to share. Okay, you now you're back. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Carvalho, for joining us. Um, we'll go through some of the questions that came through the Q&A uh, first. So the first one is, uh, can some medications increase LDL levels in the blood? Okay. Very good question. Yes. So in terms of the medications um, for high blood pressure, the answer is usually no. Okay. Um, the medications are really protective in terms of the vessels and uh, they bear, they don't have the mechanism that they act have usually nothing to do with the cholesterol and the liver, etc. I don't know if it is question is coming from something that we had in the past and when I was doing my training 15 years ago. So in the past, Physicians used to prescribe diuretics, like hydrochlorothiazide, in a very high dose. I'm talking about 100 milligrams, 200 milligrams, and nowadays it's 25 maximum milligrams, okay? So when it was used at that very high 
uh, dose, then yes, there were metabolic complications like higher risk of having diabetes, low potassium, things that were definitely not good, but it's completely different from nowadays. We know that 25 do not have of hydrochlorothiazide, for example, does not have this effect. Okay. I don't know if it, that's, that's where the question is coming from. Okay. Thank you. Um, next one. What's the relation uh, of our gut biome to our heart health? Oh, wonderful like, question. Yeah. Yeah. So gut biome. So nowadays it has been really studied. And um, I know that uh, gut biome has correlation with inflammation. Um, and a lot of other things, for example, mood, cancer, other stuff. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not a specialist in this topic. But we know that it can increase inflammation. And inflammation is directly correlated with those plaques that build up inside the coronary arteries or in the carotid arteries and so on in the periphery. So uh, I know that there are studies right now analyzing different types of diet, but so far we don't know that if a certain diet rather than the Mediterranean diet would make an impact in cardiovascular disease um, because the biome is this or that, depending on the diet that the person is following. Okay, okay thank you. Um, next one, uh, BP reduces after exercise. How long does this effect last usually? Yeah, good question. Um, so it's a, a, cumul a cumulative effect. So we know that first, when we are doing exercise, we have an increase. And later, as soon as we stop doing exercise, a gradual decrease. And in some patients, that decrease is even more pronounced. Okay. Um, we know that sometimes it will last for hours. I don't know exactly how many hours, to be honest. But we know that this effect is accumulative. So let's say... If you do exercise just once a week, you probably will have a decrease for hours. But if you exercise regularly, you have that decrease for hours, but there will be a sustained effect, like a residual effect that will prolong that benefit if you are doing it regularly. So this is well described in the literature and that you be focusing more on that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. What family is, what family of medications is terazazine? Okay, good question. So ter terazazine, let me see here the proper nomenclature. So it's an alpha blocker. Okay. So it's a medication. Very interesting, by the way. So we used to, it was one, it, it's an old uh, medication for high blood pressure. Okay. We still use that in cases that we call resistance hypertension. So when a, patient, a person is already taking multiple medications, not has not been able to take to control the blood pressure, then we will try the terazosine. Uh, it's very famous actually to take to control um, to help to control uh, the symptoms of increased or enlarged prostate. Okay. So it's very common to see men um, taking that medication and it helps usually like when they are going to often to the washroom, things like this. So it can help. So it's prescribed for the prostate, not for the high blood pressure, but for sure can help you with that. So it's an alpha uh, blocker and uh, that is, so just to finalize, uh, in the vessels, we have different receptors. So we have alpha receptors, beta receptors, and so on. So this medication, do you, let's start with the beta blockers. You, you heard me talking a lot about beta blockers. So we know that there are receptors in that vessels that respond to the beta uh, activation. So in this case, we are talking about the alpha. It's a different receptor. We have alpha one, alpha two, it's a complex thing, but uh, we are talking specifically about these alpha receptors in the periphery usually not in the heart, 
Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, next one. What if you have one higher number and not the other one sometimes? Should this be something of concern? Yeah. So good question as well. So some people uh, have, it's actually frequent to have the systolic blood pressure a little bit higher with a normal diastolic blood pressure. So the upper number is high, but the bottom number maybe is normal. It's very frequent. So yes. So if the number, the lower number is not too low, probably it's a good idea to talk to your, your physician and maybe even take more medications. If it's something that is consistent, Okay, so again, measure the blood pressure at home, following all those orientations. Sometimes it's very tricky for the physician. Sometimes the high number, the, the upper number is too high. For example, let's say 172, but the bottom number, the, uh, the lower number is too low. It's let's say 59. So you have 172 over 59, for example. Then it's tricky then sometimes we can try different things, but sometimes you need to just to be, okay, it is what it is. If also the patient is having dizziness because the lower number is too low, then we need to accept that and do other things to improve, to decrease the risk, but maybe more medication is not the answer. Okay, thank you. Um, next one. Some med meds you mentioned seem to cause weight gain. Uh, how to counter. Most doctors I've spoken to about this don't have an answer other than the obvious diet and exercise, but that has not helped me for years with weight gain ongoing. I'm taking several of the meds you have mentioned. Uh, and then the part two question and coffee drinking, what is reasonable per day? Thank you. Okay. So um, I would like to, if possible, if you can tell me which medication we you are worried about, and I'm sorry for asking that, because usually those medications, they do not increase the body weight, okay? Um, actually, there are some studies showing, for example, that the baby, sorry, that the ACE inhibitor, for example, uh, it's a good medication, just an example, for people who are at, um, who has, um, who have a, a body weight that's elevated, not on target, because we know that there are some studies showing that it can even decrease the risk of diabetes, that is a condition that unfortunately a lot of people that live with high blood pressure also live with diabetes. So if a medication can prevent diabetes, amazing, right? So uh, we can have both things at the same time. Uh, I don't see here the name. Do you see it? Not no. yet. No. Yeah, not yet. Okay. Uh, and the other question is about coffee. So it's a good question as well. Uh, we know that uh, a little bit of coffee is good. Too much coffee is definitely not good. How much is too much? Uh, there are thousands of studies. This topic is very interesting, very polemic. I would say a glass per day or a cup per day is fine. More than that, if you have heart disease, talk to your physician, okay? Maybe those who do not have a heart condition, maybe... A little bit more is fine, okay? But uh, it, we need to individualize. And of course, um, some extra beats, people that have extra beats, we know that you can be triggered by caffeine. So then maybe even one cup is too much. Okay. Okay, um, okay next one. Sorry, I went too far. Uh, okay, next one, um, kind of more of a comment. It's very hard to access your own cardiologist other than the scheduled six months or annual checkup. Uh, do you have, I guess, suggestions for other options, Carolina? Yeah, so i really sorry that I, this patient, this person is having this problem. Uh, it's something that we listen uh, many, like frequently in our office. Um, and that's why we have just, program that I, I think we sharing information and um, in a way that you can have better discussions, better conversations with your cardiologist or family physician is extremely important. Okay. 
like you know your heart or know your what what is happening you know your options and then you when you have these encounters with them then you can advocate for yourself knowing that you, what you are saying is important and uh, you should be heard i would say first person that you should try to advocate for you uh, after yourself is the family physician so if you have a concern and the family physician has not been able to address the concern because maybe it's too specific, ask, at least ask for a, a follow-up sooner than the one that was proposed. Um, if you feel that after reading about that uh, or even talking to ourselves, if you are still in the program, after talking to your superv cardiac supervisor, if you think that maybe it's worrisome, then even reach out to the clinic and say, hey, I'm, this is happening to me. I want you to see my physician earlier. It doesn't hurt. Sometimes it helps. Okay, but I'm really sorry. Unfortunately, it's happening. And uh, as a patient, I also have faced this. So I hope it, uh, things can be better soon in terms of uh, our healthcare. Okay, uh, next one. Uh, are eggs a problem for high blood pressure? No, not at all. Um, it is a problem for people who have high cholesterol, but for people who have high blood pressure, no, there is no correlation. Um, the only thing that occurs to me right now is that uh, if a person has too many eggs, it means too many protein, too much protein. And if that is a kidney disease or something associated to the ninjas person, I mean, um, then maybe X is a problem, but not because like you need to see if uh, you have, if you're healthy overall, no high blood pressure, no high cholesterol, no problems. Hey. Everything moderation, right, Marisa? That's right. Um, okay. When and how often should I take blood pressure? Daily, four times per day, morning after exercise, early evening, and night before bedtime? Okay, so this is a very good question, and I didn't have time to comment on that. So if your physician told you, measure your blood pressure. So the guidelines say measure twice in the morning, twice uh, in the evening, make a log for one week, and bring it to the physician. Okay, that's what the guideline says. If you know that your blood pressure is very well controlled or well controlled, or even that you do not have high blood pressure, I would say there is no point in measuring it every time. Sometimes there are people that are very stressed about the levels and sometimes it's even harmful, okay? It's because too much stress. I have patients that say, oh, I hate to measure blood pressure. So don't measure it, okay? Uh, or measure really when it's necessary. So I would say once a month, even less, if it's it's all, always good, uh, you always have a good control, that's once a month, I would say, or even less, okay? okay? Every six months. There is no recommendation in the guidelines about that. Okay, good. Um, next one, does a heart murmur affect blood pressure? Mm. Okay, so... Let's talk about heart murmur, okay? So heart murmur uh, means that, do you remember the chambers of the heart? We have four and we have four valves. So we have a valve that opens and closes and the blood flow goes inside that valve. Not inside, but pass through. Some people will have a, what we call stenosis. So instead of opening widely and nicely, so sometimes it doesn't open too much or there is some things there that make that to be narrow, okay? Narrow than it should. The other thing is some valves, they open too much or they keep open in a way that she was not supposed to. Then in this case, there is a leak and we are talking about regurgitation, okay? So what is the murmur? The murmur means that one of these two situations is happening, okay? Sometimes people have murmur and uh, it's because there is 
in one of those uh, chambers, in two of those chambers, there is a communication. So a communication between the atriums or the a communication between the ventricles. Okay. So these are the main causes of murmurs. But murmur is a, a noise, in other words. And then, so the murmur per se, it's not going to increase the blood pressure. But depending on the condition, it can affect the blood pressure. Usually valve disease, they don't increase the blood pressure, okay? Uh, there is one specific condition that's called aorta coarctation. So some people have the big artery that comes out of the heart, bringing blood to all the body. That's called aorta. So there is like a stenosis, but in this aorta, a coarctation. And then sometimes we can hear a different noise. And then that condition, yes, can increase the blood pressure. Uh, okay. Thank okay. you. Um, next one. Uh, I'll buy the equipment to measure BP at home. I had surgery on a dilated ascending aorta. Uh, what should my BP be? Okay. So um, individualized approach. Okay. Uh, for people who just had a heart uh, aorta surgery or aortic surgery, Usually, the surgeon is a little bit more conservative, and I completely agree with that. So usually, the blood pressure may be as low as 120 over 60, depending on uh, the situation. Best thing is talking to your own physician, okay? Remember, individualized care. So don't, don't, um, don't be surprised if they say something like lower than 120 over 60. Um, that's what I would say, but it depends if your surgery was more than three months ago, then sometimes we are more, uh, complacent and we may tolerate 130, 180, like again, individualized approach. Overall, what we can say, if you are at home and your blood pressure, any, anyone, now I'm talking about everyone. Uh, if you are at home, you measure a blood pressure, it's higher or equal 135 over 85. It's abnormal. It's elevated. Okay. So rest, really be sure that you took five minutes to 10 minutes to relax. Don't talk. Think if you, I don't know, drunk alcohol, what's your stress it's because of something. If you slept well, think about all of this, measure again. Give a break, measure again the day after. Really confirm that that number is correct. If it's really above 135 or over 85, then talk to your family physician. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, what should the diastolic blood pressure be for high-risk cardio disease? Can the systolic blood pressure or diastolic blood pressure be too low? Uh, and then second part, uh, can blood pressures change throughout the day? Okay, so it's starting from the high risk cardio. So when we look at the guidelines, they only suggest systolic. Okay, so we, I, I'm also a researcher, so we have studied thousands of people living with high blood pressure at a high risk of cardiovascular disease, and there is no consensus on what diastolic blood pressure we should target for this population okay um probably lower than 80 for sure lower than 80 um there are some studies suggesting lower than 60 70 but it's it's really debatable talking about the blood pressure during the day so what do we know during the day for some people the blood pressure will be higher in the morning Okay, it's called the early morning hypertension or effect. Okay, then usually it's pretty much stable during the day. But remember, if you have pain, if you are stressed, if you don't, if you didn't sleep well, all of these may increase the blood pressure. Then at night, what is the expected? During the day, we have a predominance of the sympathetic system. So we have a, we tend to have a higher blood pressure, like it's still normal. 
when you are sleeping, we activate the parasympathetic system. We need to relax. We need to slow down. And then the parasympathetic system will decrease the blood pressure. This is the expected and the normal. Some people, for different reasons, they don't slow down during the night. They don't activate the parasympathetic system the way they should. And the blood pressure will, unfortunately, not be lower, lower in, during the night. A common condition that does that is sleep apnea. So when people stop breathing during the night, they may have a high blood pressure during the night or higher, but not high enough to be considered too high. But if you look at the numbers compared to the day, like that drop doesn't happen. Okay. Long term, in a long term, this activation of the sympathetic system is not good. It may cause harm and lead to diseases. Did I answer everything about this question? I, yeah, let me take a look. I hope it helped. Um, yeah, and blood pressures, can they change throughout the day? Yeah. Yeah. And of course, if you exercise, as we said, um, if you, the good thing, if you do yoga, if you do mindfulness, things like this that you are relaxing, you relax and you activate the parasympathetic system. So you have a decrease at that moment. But again, if you do it regularly, it will impact in the long term. Okay. Okay. Um, next one. Is there a relation of blood pressure and pulse? When I'm exercising, I can only measure my pulse, but not my blood pressure. Yeah. So the blood pressure is a um, result of the pulse and the cardiac output, but um, not in a way that you can measure your pulse and estimate your blood pressure. It's basically not possible, okay? Okay, um, next one. Medications and exercise do wonders to lower my blood pressure, as you've indicated. However, my issue now is that is low blood pressure. So 98 over 58. Should I be concerned and how low is too low? Oh yeah, that's the other part of the question that I forgot to answer. Okay, thank you, Marisa. Mm -hmm. So well, let's just start with how much is too low. So this is also a very interesting question because we don't know exactly. So that is something called U shape or J shape. So we know that if the blood pressure is too high, we all agree that the risk of having a heart attack or a stroke is elevated, okay? Then if you decrease the blood pressure at a, until a certain point, it will be the ideal blood pressure. But if you keep decreasing the blood pressure to a point that's extremely low, then again, you increase the risk of someone having a heart attack or a stroke because for example, for the brain, there will be lack of oxygen, like like a flow to make a, make a long story short. It's not that simple. So the problem is that point is different for each of us. So if you have someone that's older, the thickness, the stiffness of the artery will be very different from someone who is at um, another age, let's say in their 20s or 30s or 40s, okay? And then that's why it's so difficult. If you have someone with coronary artery disease, for example, you know that that's, those arteries are different and they may not tolerate low blood pressure the same way that a person at the same age with no coronary artery disease will tolerate. So first thing is it's difficult to say, okay, this number is dangerous. Maybe for one person, that number is okay, but for the other, they will not tolerate and it will be dangerous, okay? The other thing is how, but generally speaking, when I will be worried about that. So if someone has a systolic blood pressure lower than 90 or lower than 60, with a few exceptions, and I will talk in one minute about the exceptions, then it's usually too low, okay? Especially if they are having symptoms, so dizziness, in a way that every time they stand up, every time they have little heaviness, they really are not feeling well. Okay. Important to say if you 
had a procedure, a, a heart event, and your med or your medications were recently changed, then your body will take sometimes three days to adjust. During those three days, it's possible that you will have some lightheadedness, you will have some other symptoms, and it's okay if it's once in a while, okay? If it's just like not all the time. Then again, measure your blood pressure, follow, see, don't forget to keep yourself well hydrated and then see if after three days it's better. Of course, if it's too bad, of course, talk to your physician. This is one occasion. We need to remember that there are people living with high heart failure, okay? So when the heart muscle is weak or was weak, but now they need to take different medications to control that. So when a person has high heart failure, um, they usually need to take a lot of medications to help the heart muscle to heal, right? Those medications, one of the side effects, as we saw together today, they help the heart to heal, but they will decrease the blood pressure. So for these people, sometimes the physician will say, okay, let's tolerate that blood pressure that sometimes is as low as 80 over something. But because I know the benefits for the heart muscle is really strong, is really um, clear. Okay? Again, if you are having too much symptoms, dizziness, lightheadedness, then talk to your physician. Otherwise, think that that medication is helping your heart or vessels uh, protecting yourself. Okay. Um, okay, are you okay with two or three more questions? Oh, of course. Yeah. Okay, there's a few more, but we may not get up to all of them, but we'll, we'll try to do that. Um, what happens if systolic pressure is high, but diastolic is okay? Uh, so 135 over 93 is the example. Okay, so it's the opposite of this isolated systolic blood pressure. Yeah, so whatever number is high, doesn't matter if it's just one, it is still considered high blood pressure, okay? So measure the blood pressure at home. Be sure that that number is accurate. So in this case, I would say two times in the morning, two times in the afternoon. Uh, don't forget to relax everything that I just told you. And then if it's really consistent, talk to your family physician. Probably uh, you need to do more lifestyle changes and or more medications or different medications. I see one question here about the telmizartan, if it mm -hmm. induces diuresis. Mm -hmm. So no, so telmizartan is um, a ARB and uh, it's um, almost equal to the ACE inhibitor. So ARBs, if you, uh, you remember. And then uh, no, it does not induce. It's not like it, no, the, the way that it acts is not supposed to induce diure diuresis. So for those who does not understand, like it's not a water pill and there's no effect in um, getting you rid of the water. Okay. It's really a different way of acting. Okay. Um, recently, the smartwatch developed an app for monitoring blood pressure uh, and ACG. How, ECG, how accurate is that for the blood pressure oh, in a smartwatch? Amazing. amazing. So that's the question I was waiting for. Thank you who did that, who made that. So I do not have time to talk about that, but we have a lot of new devices in the market, okay? Um, there are some apps that promises that you just put your finger here and they will tell your blood pressure. Unfortunately, it's not the reality yet, okay? So no, it's not accurate enough yet, okay? And uh, the, uh, the watches or the smart watches um, I saw that recently, but uh, there are not enough research behind that to say that it's accurate to the point that you will throw away your blood pressure machine and use your watch or your cell phone or these devices. So not yet, okay, maybe in the near future. So if you needed to invest your money in something, go to, with the traditional um, device and you and, um, and we have devices that are very good, uh, accurate. You can find in famous um, 
places like Shoppers, Rexall, or even Costco, or Amazon, or whatever you prefer. But to, like widely available, you can compare the prices. Doesn't need to be anything fancy. Just that really measurable impression. Okay. Um, next one is HRT safe to consider with high blood pressure on medication? Uh, I don't see the question. It's RT. Uh, ah, HRT. Form oh, HRT. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So HRT. So for those who uh, are following, is hormone replacement therapy. Okay, so usually prescribed for women uh, after or during menopause. So it's a good question. Uh, we know that uh, the, the, there are different studies showing that it's possible that it can increase the blood pressure. Okay, so it's not something that it's so clear. Some women will have that side effect and those other women will not have it. So the key thing is if someone, for some reason, uh, prescribe it, um, HRT for you, then you need to for sure follow not only your blood pressure, but your cholesterol, your blood sugar, etc. as anybody else. Um, just be careful because um, especially for people who had a heart attack or a stroke, we have some concerns about hormone replacement therapy. and. Um, so just be careful with that. Okay. Um, how often should you measure blood pressure? And if it goes higher for a short period of stress, should anything be done such as increasing meds or dosage? Okay, this is a very also interesting question. So the first thing is identifying the cause of the hypertension. Okay. I didn't have time to talk about secondary causes of hypertension. So when someone has hypertension and there is something else happening, for example, with sleep apnea. So people who have this condition, they stop breathing during the night. And if you treat sleep apnea, it will help the blood pressure. If someone has pain, you treat the pain, not the blood pressure, and then the blood pressure will be better. And anxiety, if especially if it's just for some hours of the day, Usually, we need you to, first of all, make everything that's possible to help that person to manage better stress or anxiety. Uh, if you are still in the program, we have some more interesting workshops. If you are no longer in the program, reach out. We can try to help you. Uh, but treat first your uh, anxiety or stress. Then if, it, if nothing helped, then... That is something that we call ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. So you go home with a blood pressure machine and then the physician will see, okay, which time of the day it was elevated. And then they may think about changing the time of the medication, trying to protect you better at that certain time. Okay. We usually don't give more medications because of that specific time. And then things that we know can help so, for example, um, yoga, meditation, um, there are some apps that you can download for free in your phone. And there are meditations. Uh, if you are, even if you're not into the meditation thing, I know some people don't like it, but just listening to a uh, calm music, to something interesting um, that brings you, gives you pleasure, like songs or doing something that you like to relax, a nice walk in the park or somewhere else, seeing things that you like can help to decrease that stress, the sympathetic system, and it will end up in decreasing the blood pressure. Okay. Okay, last question, just because of time, because there's a lot, there's quite a few more, sure. lots of really great questions uh, from this group. Um, so let's go with, uh, so can Ramipril cause muscle spasms, cramps in toes and fingers? No, no, this is definitely not a common side effect or a side effect at all of Ramipril. Uh, Ramipril does not uh, spoliate or get you rid of your potassium. So usually, no. Okay, okay. thank you. Of course, everything is possible in this world. So we never say never. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so we will leave it there. Um, for now, and then um, 
for the questions that we can answer that haven't been answered tonight, we'll figure out a way to send it to the group um, with, the, with the answers either within the next newsletter, um, but we'll update you as far as where to find those answers. Because um, I'm not sure if this will be, this recording will be solely on the alumni channel for cardiac rehab or if it'll also be on cardiac college. So stay tuned, it will be recorded and posted somewhere for you to check out. Um, I'll send a reminder in early or mid-May about uh, the next talk with Veronica. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Carvalho, for joining us this evening and, and providing so much information, excellent information for everyone. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, lovely to, to see all of your, uh, all the names on the list and, uh, and the, the tally growing uh, every time we do this. So fantastic. Um, so have a great night. And we will see you all in May. Okay. Thank you. Thank all. you, everyone. She was amazing. Thank you for the great questions. We will do yes, everything to answer them. Thank you, Marisa. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Bye, everyone.